Hey folks, put the kettle on. It's tea time with Salty Brine. <laughs> Brace yourself, high octane action. Tea and chats bring satisfaction. Laugh and sing before we tea you. Yes, we clamor to be near you. Oh, now look who we have here. It's Niall Harris. Oh. Welcome, Niall. Welcome, audience. Welcome, folks at home. Salt is here to interview our guests, and then we'll go. That's right. We can encourage you to buy tickets to this show Cause maybe you are on the fence now You'll invite all of your friends So let's cut all this nonsense and sip our tea And get to know Niall Harris! Whoa! Oh, Niall. Oh, Salty. Thank you so much for oh, being no, here. Oh, no, thank you for having me. Gosh, you're, uh, you're resplendent in red. Oh, thank you. Always. Always? Do you love red? Um, I do love red. It's yeah. become my favorite color. <gasps> How long has it been your favorite color? For about two years now. Two years. You've like, like locked into red. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it gosh. feels very strong. It feels very bold. It is bold. It feels like America. Oh, <laughs> bold like a, yes. So, yes. Yes. Do you feel a strong sense of patriotism? I, I mean, try. You, do you? Yeah. Yeah, I try. I think a lot about American patriotism. We have mm. to, you know, redefine it. Yes, which I think your show is trying to do a little bit. I think so. I want to talk about that, yeah, but let's do first. It. Shall we have some tea? Please. I have an Earl Grey for you. Oh, perfect. Darling, yes. All right. Do you take uh, milk or sugar? Uh, I will take a little bit of milk. Yeah. Good, gorgeous, gorgeous. I think we've got some for you, yes. Yeah. I'm going to have some, too. Do you yeah. like these teacups? I know. They're gorgeous. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Have, help, please I help mean, yourself. Yeah, no, I mean, this is... We're into agency. Um, yes, yeah. Yeah, make yourself at home. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to have a little, too. Of course. These are my great-grandmother's teacups. For real? For real. She collected them. And my mom had them sitting in a glass cabinet in her house. And I said, you don't ever use those. Give them to me. So this tea is like, th this tea time is like a family lineage, it's a practice. Yeah, it's it's like something you've inherited. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, do you cheers for tea? Well, let's do cheers. Yes. Why not? Oh my God. I've never done it before. I know. There's liquor in this cup. Oh! Let's get to Ooh. Mmm. It's like in those drag queen shows where like they're drinking coffee, but they're actually like drinking liquor on set, like, like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, there's something like Prohibition era too about drinking liquor out of a tea, exactly. a tea cup. Exactly. Mm, I like it. Okay, notes mm. for next time. Exactly. <laughs> okay, I. Uh, the first thing we must do. Yes. Is talk about what's in my special drawer. Oh my God! A big oh, picture of me. My God. What do we think about this? This is a full cover page article about you and your show in the art section of the New York Times. It's crazy. I can't believe it. I want to point out, here is a tiny, tiny picture of Alicia Keys. <laughs> I made a joke about that in the and show last night. And a massive picture of you! Yeah. You're a star! I'm obsessed. How does this feel? It feels surreal and feels really exciting that, yeah. like, you know, the mythology around the show is spreading. I made a joke about that last night. Um, in the show, I was like, you're Alicia Keys, like, you're very small, and you're Alicia Keys over there looking up at me. <laughs> and I was like, standing on this platform. But, I don't know, let's not get into it, but Alicia Keys is a hot button topic. I mean, I mean, I mean yeah, because uh, I think about the public leader. But, um, but yeah, it's really exciting to be in the Times, and like, Gia, the dance critic who wrote about the work, did a really, I thought, really beautiful job of trying to like, yeah, trying to, yeah, share what this show's about. It's about so many different things. It's so complex, and I really felt like she took all the nuance and made something legible, which is something that I have never been able to do. <laughs> I'm really, like, afraid that you're going to ask me what the show is about, and I'm going to tell you, like, I'm not going to be able to answer it, but you can ask me. Oh, no. And That's I can, my next question. Exactly. You can ask it, and I can stumble my way through it, but... Let's yes. see what happens. I'm going to pull... Yeah. I have so many drawers in this table. Oh, my God. I Look love at, a gag, a prop gag. I mean, really ah! <laughs> this makes me feel like a real... Talk show host. That's good. I have to have my cards. Mm -hmm. What's what is the show about? The, your show is called This House Is Not A Home. What's True. it about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, it's perfect. It's fine. <laughs> I, I should expect this by now. I'm going to say it's an improvised musical mm. about American nationalism. All right. There that's, we are. That's there my we are answer back to nationalism for the day. again. Yeah. I think it's really important. And it comes back to why I love the color red. My best friend, um, before he passed away, tried to make a bunch of red hats that said, you niggas in trouble. And when he passed, I was left with a duffel bag of, of red hats. <gasps> and um, that kind of just became this sort of 
thing about like, oh, I, this is the thing that I've been, this is the thing that I inherited. So now it took me down this sort of investigation of American nationalism. And it's all improv, it's all music based. And I know it was when you were singing earlier, I was like, this is a musical. My show is a musical. And it's a musical. There yeah. it is. Yeah. Th that just came to you when we were doing our musical. It just number. came to me that, <laughs> yes, I mean, I love musical theater. It's uh -huh. a big, I started my career, I didn't start my career, but like, you know, middle school musical theater is very yeah. much like, you know, an important point of reference for me. And That's how a lot of theater makers find of theater. Course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course, the musicals. And, um, and yeah, sound is a big part of the show. I work with three sound designers who compose the show live each night. So like, as we're performing, like our voices are being live mixed via microphones and they're live composing with us. So, and they make about 90 minutes of music each night live. Improvised so it's, live. Yeah, so the music is the spine of the show and then everything else is just decoration. That's incredible. Yeah. You talk about inheritance and these yeah. hats that you inherited. You also inherited a Bounce, bounce house, house. Yeah. which is a major component of the show. It's yeah. like a, a, a centerpiece, I, yeah. I imagine, on the stage. Yeah? yeah. Can you tell me what does the bounce house represent? What is why why bounce house? A uh, why a bounce house? I think that um, me and my best friend Trevor were thinking a lot about the idea of a bounce house in like 2020, 2021, mm. and you know, yesterday was January 6th, and we were thinking a lot about the Capitol, and thinking about institutionality and institutions, and the bounce house became this sort of meme-like revision on. U.S. institutions, but it was also something that's fun and bright colored and like, you know, it's a space for failure, like I say in the show. A bounce house is a temporary structure for black people to practice failure. You can jump up and down and it's a safe space and like you can crash and burn and like nothing will happen to you. So it was a comment on institutions, but also just like a fun sort of bold image that you'll remember. A yes. house. Yeah. It is a very bold image and there's some other, it's a, it's a, youthful image, like yeah, a childlike exactly, image. Yeah. And there's some other images in the show. Yeah. Uh, a giant gingerbread man costume. Yeah. Woody mm -hmm. from Toy Story. Huge yeah. like Woody lifestyle, which you wear, yeah? Yes, um, yeah, the gingerbread man is like a big mascot costume and then Woody is just a mask that I wear, so his proportions are human-like. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Amazing, and I, can I say what you came in here today that you had in your bag when you came in, or is that yeah, a surprise? Course, no, so no. you had like a toy, a toy gun, yeah. water gun. Yeah. Um, what is, there's, there's some child, so all these like ch childhood toys and ideas like, uh, and then the subject matter of the show, as I'm reading about it, it's sounds like you're dealing with some kind of heavy, heavier topics. Yeah. How do those two things intermingle I mean, for you? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. You know, contrast brings clarity, mm -hmm. but I guess in that sense, the bounce house came first and then we built this sort of primary color world around the bounce castle. And I guess maybe, you know, Trevor, uh, my friend who passed away, who, um, He's a childhood friend, so yeah. maybe in some sort of way, like I met him in high school when I was 15, so maybe in some kind of way when I think about the things that he inspires in me, it takes me back to adolescence. Mm. So in that way, I feel like that's where all of this adolescent imagery has come from. And, um, but yeah, I'm also a clown, so I always am trying to find like, you know, things that can inspire joy and humor, but I can flip it and turn it into something else on the drop of a dime. So I guess that's kind of like where some of those images came from. That's incredible. Yeah. And I'm hearing you say primary colors and we're like back to the red shirt again. Yeah. It's like also part of your life. Yeah. I um, mean, yeah, I feel like the show has become my life in a way like I, it's not like, it's not, it's not a costume anymore. I'm just no, like no. always just in, in primary colors now. It just makes me, it's, just, it's my uniform. It's that part I feel of, yeah, 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 yeah. Tell me about clowning. I yeah. love watching clowning and yeah. clowns and also, in many people's minds brings up a sense of childhood, but mm -hmm. what is clowning for you? Um, clowning is a, what is clowning to me? I wanna say it's a state of being, but mm. I see clowning as like a, I describe it as like the relationship between performer and audience. I feel like drag queens are clowns, yes. I'm clowns, but it's just about like uh, creating something like live that's happening in the room that is, yeah, negotiating something between audience and performers. And just like when I think about like Shakespeare's gestures or whatnot, they're always the people who can go in between classes, like high class and low class. And they're the people who can see the truth mm -hmm. and no one listens to them. And mm -hmm. they're able to point out like things that other people can't see and no one listens to them. So mm -hmm. I kind of like that positionality, like in between classes, the wi like they're the wisest one in the room, but no one takes them seriously. Yes. But then also, as like a performance technique, I see it as just like a, yeah, a way of mediating space between audiences and performers. I had some really great clown teachers in college. 
I studied with a really wonderful clown teacher, Robert Francisconi, and it was a three-year clowning pedagogy that I did in undergrad. And um, yeah, that's just kind of been a modality for me that feels like helps me understand how to be in a room with people. Something you keep coming back to again yeah. and again. Yeah. yeah. I do a lot of drag performance. Yeah. And I For some reason, I thought you were going to be in drag this morning. <laughs> I thought that that was going to be Did you see pictures of me in drag somewhere? I did. I did. Oh, they're all over the internet. I can't get them. I've tried to have them taken down. No, no, not really. I mean, this is how I feel about this. This is how I feel about this interview. This like this internet footprint is going to last forever. This is last going to live forever. You just can't ever erase things off the internet. Well, I'm very proud of the drag performance, and and I'm uh, uh, resonate a lot with what you're saying about clowning. Mm -hmm. it feels like um, you're taking a step back on the outside of the culture or society or mm. something, and you're, so you're able to comment on it. Speaking and between truth to worlds, power. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And then between the b outside of the binary gender, is, mm -hmm. that's where I feel it, mm -hmm. um, which, is, which is so exciting. Mm -hmm. um, this, so the show started as a Google Doc, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. A live Google Doc that you could sort of par uh, yeah, interact with it, as you met Yeah, it. we called it a hyperlink opera. So like we <laughs> invited, it was a time-based performance. You got a time to arrive and then you entered the show in an empty Google Doc and me and Trevor like <sighs> live drafted it before the audience's eyes like in a Google Doc and like the instructions were to click every link and we created a 15-page manifesto like live. It was like a COVID time, it was a COVID performance. Oh, yes, so that I was see, kind yes. of like, where our thinking was in digital performances. But yeah, it was a Google Doc performance. That's a, such a, an exciting way to interact. What, what I was talking yesterday with another artist in the festival about virtual theater mm -hmm. and, and how it can really be successful. Yeah. So a lot of people tried it. And s sometimes, oftentimes, it would like just, it, you missed the connection of the audience, right? We were all searching as theater makers mm -hmm. for that. But this, the, so were you improvising what you were writing on the document as you went? So each it's time the show was always improvised. Different. Well, we only did the show one time, oh, so the oh, document oh. is now like set and locked and it's something to refer to. So but it's it a was one time only, but improv. it's an improv based thing. But yeah, digital theater is interesting. I think you can't treat it like IRL theater. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's where I feel like it goes flat. It's like if you just try to like, set up a camera and try to do like what you would do in a room with people to a camera, that's when it's like kind of deadly. But you know, I spend a lot of time on the internet. I think about the internet a lot. Mm. So I felt like a very natural transition for my work when we were in COVID times to take the performances online or take this sort of discourse online because I just post a bunch online already. So it just felt like a natural sort of continuation of the conversation. I never thought about it in the way that because I looked at the the document mm -hmm. that you made, and I never thought about it as text. I mean, I always thought about it as I mean, and you have links to mm -hmm. videos and all these things, so mm -hmm. there is this like really visual. But but to start from a place of like you're looking at text, mm -hmm. that's so good. Yeah. Um, the title of the show, "This yeah. House Is Not a Home," mm -hmm. comes from a Luther. The title of a Luther Vandross song. Amen. Yes, it I does. love this song. It's a beautiful song. It's so good. Do you feel strong? Do you do you love Luther Vandross? Is it is it? I do. I do love Luther. I mean, I share about it in the show sometimes, depending on my mood, but mm. Luther Vandross was my mother's favorite singer. Mm. And um, again, another, so it's another piece of inheritance around things that I've inherited. And yeah, I just have this memory of the day that Luther Vandross died, and I remember very vividly my mother's response to his passing. And um, so maybe that's just a, another childhood memory that just kind of sticks with me, and that I guess and then when we're thinking about bounce house and home and America, is this house a home? Is this country a home to us or to people? I guess that just kind of felt like a pertinent cultural reference to kind of bring up. Yeah, gorgeous. Yeah. Do you are you a singer? Um, I I can hold yeah. a tune. You, all right. <laughs> is there singing in the show? Do you sing? In yeah, the show? I sing. Yeah, because the there's all this show. music. Yeah, I sing like you know. I just sing like you know. I. I do a rendition of Gimme Gimme from Thoroughly Modern Millie in the All show. Right. We have some Janine Tesori jokes in the show. <laughs> I sing the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing in the show. But again, it's whatever, there's always a tune in my heart. So again, the show is very porous that like, oh, today I think I'm gonna sing um, Mary J. Blige, No More Drama. Uh, yes. No more drama in my life, I don't ever wanna hurt again. Like, <laughs> I woke up feeling that way. I was just like, oh, no more pain, no more tears, no more crying every night. And I might sing that tonight. And just like the space, like, that's what I love about the show. It can hold whatever impulse is of the day. Where you are right now. Yeah. So yeah, we do sing a lot. Should we, should we sing a song? Uh, do you want to sing a song? Oh no. <laughs> now I'm suddenly nervous. I don't want to sing a song. I just sang a song and I, I don't know, want... you just sang a song. Yeah. Wow. My heart rate just went up. I know. Do you get nervous? Do you have stage fright? I do. Yeah, me too. I say in the show again, like this hurts me more than it hurts you. I think people <laughs> think that like, this is not painful. Yeah. This is 
excruciating. <laughs> this is excruciating. Performing <laughs> is excruciating. There's nothing cute about this. Yeah, yeah. But like, we just do it. Yeah, why do you do it? Why do you do it? It's, it's because why? it's painful, yeah. Do you I know? Mean, I'm a, I'm a masochist. <laughs> I really like, I'm really like clear with myself about this, that like I'm really like, this is painful to me, but mm -hmm. I feel like this is the only tools that I've been given or gifted by whomever to make the change that I want to see in the world. It's like by making these plays. But I am really excited. I'm very eager. The next play, I can't be in the next play. You're just going to be. What, uh, well, right, I tried. I right. mean, that's interesting. I mean, I tried when this show started. The whole goal was for me to not be in the show, and that's uh. why I played Gingerbread Man. I was like, Gingerbread Man. I make one cameo. I make one cross, and then. It's Malcolm Show, the, who's the principal dancer in the piece. Mm. And I really wanted to try to remove myself from the show, but I'm always kind of the centerpiece of all my shows, for better or for worse. But I am eager for a time where I can just play director and just watch people do things that I tell them to Have do. Have you done that before? Have you had that experience? Uh, very few and far between. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm always like, in it. In it. Up there. And people, are, like, someone was grilling me at the bar last night about, like, why do I call it a play? Yeah. Like, I, I call it a play. And I don't have any really good answers for that, but in my eyes, it's a play. And I feel like it's the fair thing to my collaborators. Like I can only put them through something that I will put myself through. Mm. And I guess leading by example, I think that's my directorial vision is like leading by example to be like, and that's why I go first in the show. Like I have a big solo at the, at the top ish of the show mm. to be kind of like, this is my bid, this is my offering. And then I let my collaborators kind of take it. But it feels like, yeah, fair, like that I have to shed some blood too in order to like make it like fair. Maybe that's that masochism coming into exactly. the like, right like, 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 I have to like put I have to like put in the work and then I have to like go <laughs> through this. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's dark. I don't know. <laughs> but the no, show's I actually like quite it. funny, like which is like funny. Like last night felt very jovial. But that's the weird thing about the show, and I think that's what I like about the Times piece. She says like, and I thought it was interesting that the New York Times can endorse something that they don't know what they're endorsing because I literally say something different every night. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's a slippery, slippery, slippery work. But yeah, last night felt quite joyful. Sometimes it feels kind of heavy, but last night felt very joyful and sweet. But um, I think that's, I think that sounds thrilling to be yeah. quite honest with you. Um, there's, f from all the photos and descriptions of the show, yeah. and everything even you're saying now, it seems like the show is just filled with images, ideas, costumes, dance, music. Mm -hmm. It feels maximalist. It yes. feels stuffed with stuff. Yeah. The stuff I make feels really maximalist to me. Mm -hmm. I work in that way, and I, I keep hearing that word a lot, like Taylor Mack's work and Mich Machine Dazzle's work. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that there's a, a relationship between queerness and maximalism? Oh, of course. What is that? Do you, know, um, do you know? Have you thought about that? I'm thinking about some I think, it, is it Machine Dazzle's book called Queer mm -hmm. Maximalism? Yes, it is. Okay, I was like literally. So, something like that, yeah. Yeah, I was like literally, I was like, I've heard these words put in direct correlation with one another yeah. like most recently. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm always, I'm not, I can't speak for all queer people, but I know for myself, I'm always seeking the more and more of life. Mm. Like, I feel like that's always like, you know, the seeking the more and more, and then maybe that's why I'm veering towards maximalism and also just like, I don't know, queerness and maximalism. <laughs> the more and more in life. More and more. That's all I have to say about that. But then also, I think it's just like trends too. Like, you know, when I think about postmodernity or like the sort of avant garde theater makers of the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, it was all about minimalism. Yes. Like, minimalism was the sort of like identifier of those sort of avant garde movements. And now, maybe it's the internet, maybe it's just like, yeah, this maximalism is very in right now. So I guess there's something unique there. But yeah, maximalism is, I say, my ins and outs for 2024, maximalism is in, minimalism is out. Oh, right. You, you heard it here, folks. Exactly. Clashing patterns are also in. You can wear stripes and polka dots or plaid and things are things that like, you know, that is definitely, you're going to see that on I the streets. I almost did it today. I almost wore a pattern tie with this and then I, I got scared. I know, but that's in for 2024. Okay, well, next, totally that's it. In okay, I'm doing it. Yeah. Um, you've described the show as a memorial. Yes. And you've mentioned your friend Trevor. Yeah. What what makes a good memorial? Do you did I'm you right. try do you set out? What a crazy question, Salty. <laughs> what makes a that's good memorial? That's a big question. That the people but the people who are memorializing feel um, feel fulfilled. 
It's, mm. But I say this, I mean, why am I calling the show so much today? But I say it's sometimes the act, there's an inherent narcissism in the act of grieving. This is about me. Like, it's more about the, the bereaved than the person lost. So a memorial is for those who have been left behind. Yeah. Um, it's not about the, the person lost. They're, they're dead. Yeah. But <laughs> it's about, like, um, yeah, like the people who have been left behind, the memories. The memories. Yeah. I don't know. But what was your the, fi finish that question? Is that the end of the question? That that's sort of my question. But I, it's just the oh, second part of it is: did 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 it did the making this help you grieve? Is that a, is that a process? Mm. I mean, yeah. I mean, it has it has definitely. But then that's what's so perverse about it. Like you know, this is a restaging. We did the show six months ago. Mm. Six months ago, I felt very much like, mm, this is really helping me. Now, <laughs> I'm kind of like, hmm, <laughs> what is this about now? But I guess I said it like, you know, again, I say in the show, I'm clout chasing through grief. Like, it becomes like about, I don't know, this restaging feels like it's about something else. Yeah. And I haven't been able to put my finger on what it's about yet, but I think definitely, like, all I wanted when my friend passed away was for people to know about his brilliant life and work. And I feel, like, really, really proud that, like, that's happening now. Like, you know, we're in the New York Times and I'm talking about my friend's legacy. Yeah. The things that were left behind, the things that he inspired me to see in the world, his unique, uncanny, Afro-pessimistic view on life. <laughs> and I'm getting to share his pedagogy. So that feels like really beautiful to me to get to like keep that legacy ongoing and moving forward in the world. And that feels like a successful memorial. It's like it's mm. it's ongoing. It's like it's planting a seed so it can become a tree that so it can flower and create fruit of like proliferating the ideas in the world. That feels like more important to me. A memorial is not like a fixed thing. It's a it's a launching pad for like you know for things to keep going, ideas to keep moving, and the ways that this person inspired me to keep inspiring other people in the world. I think that was a damn good answer to that question. Thanks. And I hadn't thought when I read the article, but yeah, I mean, there's your picture and your name, but his name in the Times, I too. I always brunch him. Like, it's always, like, yeah. I love, like, the, Helen Shaw did a really beautiful, like, one-liner about the show, like a dance field eulogy to his friend Trevor Brazil. And that's, I feel like, yeah, that's really, like, the top line. Like, that is really important to me when I think about the show. Incredible. Yeah. You mentioned failure a minute ago. Yeah, of course. And... Uh, I, in researching you before the show, I, I read stuff about you talking about failure and that it feels really important to you. Mm -hmm. in, in what way is failure important? And uh, failure, I'm assuming, because you're improvising, maybe happens on stage. Exactly. In the show for I you. guess that's what I was going to say. Like, improvisation is an act of dancing with and alongside failure. Uh. And so, yeah, and yeah, it's a, the show is like a dramaturgy of failure. Like, it's always like at any moment, the whole thing can just collapse. Like, it's just like so moment to moment. And and yeah, failure, risk taking. It's just about like leaning into the not knowing and the potential that like, you know, we can all genuinely, I can genuinely not know what is gonna come out of my mouth. And mm -hmm. that is like, that feels like flirting with failure. But my friend always presses me about this. My friend Engvo, who wrote a really beautiful essay about the work most recently. Because yeah, I don't know. We say failure a lot, but what does failure mean in this context? <laughs> it's a kind of impossible, like it's kind of an impossibility. I think it sounds very sexy, but like it really, and I'm like, how could you fail this interview? Like what, 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 like you, you asked the wrong question. Like what does failure yeah, actually, yeah. actually, actually, actually mean? I don't know, but I, I like to think about failure. It gives me like, it makes me feel like, how does, what does thinking about failure make me feel? <laughs> right, it gives me permission and it feels like permission and it's just like, oh, nothing can go wrong. If I just say it, I'm like, oh, I'm afraid of failing. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think one of the, one of the, great things about, as I discovered art, was that there was no wrong answer, right? Yeah. That there was no way to do it wrong. There was no real exactly. way to fail. Yeah. And that's very freeing. Yeah. But it also is kind of scary. Yeah. To me, it feels I'm very thinking about, scary. I don't know what this book is actually about, but it's a good like, the queer art of failure. Mm. Um, don't know what the book's about. Never read it. <laughs> Never read it. But, well, I gotta look just, it up. but just like, you know, the I mean, title is that enough. title is enough. <laughs> I mean, Sometimes that's, the that's what I'm thinking about. Like, I mean, that's me and with all these theory. I have all these theory references. I'm like, I read the introduction. And I felt like that <laughs> gave me good. like gave me enough. I'm like, oh, I have one line. The queer out of failure. Do you have a favorite moment of failure? Where um, you're like, yeah, I botched that. 
Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, every day of my life. Uh, yeah. I mean, to be truth, I fail a lot in romantic relationships. That's like uh, really like the, spe the, si the space in my life that I, I embrace a lot of failure. But on stage, or in my creative life, I don't know. Again, failure is so subjective. I can fail myself. I think the only way I can fail is if I'm not telling the truth. Mm. That's the only barometer of like, I think of failure, I think is really, cause like I've had shows where I'm like, I didn't go out there and do what I set out to do. Mm. That's what the experiment was, but I think, I can think of times in my life where I was not always truthful mm -hmm. because I was embarrassed about what my truth actually was yes. in that moment. And I feel like that's when I feel like I failed myself or an audience or a group of people is when I wasn't always telling the truth because I was afraid of like optics or yeah. afraid of the permanence of this video. And yeah. I, but that's when I start to think, because I actually feel, I hate talking on record. <laughs> I really, really do. It's happening right now. I know, I do, and I hate this. It's horrible. I hate this, it's I'm horrible. I'm so sorry. I know, it's fine. I'm, I'm a masochist, you. I'm a masochist, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, let's do this at 11.30 in the morning. Okay. But, um, but yeah, I think that's what I also love about the theater is that like, anything that you really say, it's like there and it's as gone as quickly as it's said. Uh. It's like, it's yeah, yeah. memories. It's like, ephemeral. Yeah, it's super, super ephemeral. And I say so many things in the show that like, it just piles on top of each other. I say something that's kind of like, oh, that was a little cringe. I'm just like, it's if I just say 12 more things, poof, it's like gone. It's way back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I've never failed before, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really thinking about it. Like, I don't think that's I've ever, it. I don't think I've ever half failed. There it is. I'm trying so hard to fail that I've never failed. <gasps> I failed at failing. <laughs> In that way. You just completely blew my mind. No. No? No. Okay. I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> you say in the, at the very end of this amazing New York Times article, you say you have this dream yeah. that you want to direct a pop star concert. Yeah. And I am, especially after talking to you now, dying to see that happen. Mm -hmm. I want to see that show. Mm -hmm. Do you have it in your head? Do you know? Do you know what it looks like? What what we might see if we came to see your? I mean, it would have to depend on the artist that yeah. I'm working with. You know, like I mentioned, Doja Cat in the article. Mm. I mean, she has a really solid like stadium tour that she's working on right now. That's really beautiful and like really great design. But I don't know. I mean, the real dream. I mean, I, that is a dream of mine. But the real, real, real dream mm. that I should have said <laughs> is I want to. I've said this for years now. I will direct an Olympic opening ceremony. Yes. That is my actual dream. Like a weird nat nationalistic parade of like at a gargantuan scale, pyrotechnics, like like 500 black children like waving flags. <laughs> like you can just do like crazy stuff. And like, and you're like, this is like the world, like that is the world stage. Like yes. representing your nation on the world stage. So I am, that's what I'm deeply, deeply about. And I have some thoughts, like, you know, my favorite theater director, one of my favorite theater director is um, Dimitri Pampayanau. I butchered your last name, I'm so sorry. But he did the Athens opening ceremony in 2004. And mm. it's so beautiful, like what he does and that thing. And like, yeah, it's a really fun palette to just play. But yeah, I really want my next show, I want to do a pyrotechnique show. Okay. Like, yeah, pyrotechnics, but it's called pyrotechnique. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, a, it's like a thing. I've been pitching this like crazy. Yes, I've been pitching yes. that crazy. Like, there's like, there's a barge going down the Hudson. You're at the <laughs> shed, they open the doors, and it's like, doo, 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 doo. and like, it's like, yeah, it's like a syncopated, like a synchronized pyrotechnic show. No one has let me do this yet, but. When I do the Olympic <laughs> National Ceremony or when I do my Doja Cat tour, I think pyrotechnics, that's super fun. We have got to get you out of the theater and into the streets because I you want so. to go outside and up. Yeah. It's like incredible. The theater, yeah, the streets are the best theater. Uh, Niall, it has been an absolute oh, pleasure so talking to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our studio audience. Yes. Niall's show, uh, This House Is Not A Home, is playing at Abrams Arts Center through January 14th. Go check it out. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Everybody, thank you for being here. Nate, Nate Wyden, take it away. <laughs>